Hi everyone, um, welcome to this um, afternoon's public lecture. This lecture is one of a series that we're running as part of the AHRC funded project, Grief, a study of human emotional experience at the University of York. My name is Becky Miller and I'm a postdoctoral research associate for this project, working alongside Matthew Ratcliffe, Louise Richardson, Emily Hughes and Eleanor Byrne. The overarching, overarching aim of this uh, project is to develop a detailed, wide ranging and integrated account of what it is to experience grief. For updates on this project and upcoming talks, you can visit our website, griefyork.com, or follow us on social media with the Twitter handle at griefyork. Today, we're delighted to welcome Professor Douglas Davis. Professor Douglas Davis trained in both anthropology and theology and is a professor in the study of religion and director of the Center for Death and Life Studies at Durham University. Today, he's gonna to give a lecture on grief, personhood and belongings. The lecture will run for around an hour, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. At the conclusion of the talk, my colleague Emily Hughes will field the questions. Um, please note that this talk's being recorded, but the recording will stop before the questions. With that, uh, I'd like to warmly welcome Professor Davis to speak with us. Becky, thank you very much. And thanks to your research project and group at University of York for inviting me to give this particular lecture today. It's beautifully sunny outside. I'm sure you're all looking out of your windows, but we got our own window to look at for the next hour and a half or so. The title of my lecture is Grief, Personhood and Belongings, with a kind of a subtitle on the stuff of death, death cleaning and life clearing. Now, from the project you're, you're all involved with and the lives we all lead, the question will emerge where to start. We could start anywhere on this great map of human emotion, experience and life situations. Our memories, our dreams. Maybe we wish to go to some theoretical anchor points and I'll mention three or four books, which we'll put up at the very end of the lecture, a very brief page of references. Perhaps we will wish to start with something very personal, because once you start talking about grief and death related things, we all have anecdotes, profound anecdotes, passing anecdotes. We could start there. But what I want to do in the lecture is to mix, if you like, a, a great number of issues with the occasional theoretical hook to hang things on, but with opportunity, and this is part of my plan in this lecture really, to cover half a dozen or so elements, one or two of which will probably interest one or two of you in relation to, to what you're doing. I hope that the many loose ends that will emerge during my ramblings might find some kind of um, knot at the end, whether it be a, a, there'll be loose ends or granny knots or reef knots, time alone will tell. And it will tell because this kind of area, we enter with the skills of our own life experience some of which we've talked to other people about, some of which we've never talked to anybody about. The depth of who you are, who I am, is considerable. And I'm afraid I've got to that point in my life now where the thoughts of simplicity rather flee me or attach themselves very strongly to me. But there they are, how we cope with them is an issue, but to know that we don't understand certain things is important. And perhaps to know that we can't understand certain things is important as well. So with those rather brief, waffly introductory points, let's think about grief, personhood and belongings. Where am I going to start? Well, I'm going to start with a mini case study. I'm 
taking it because it saved all ethical issues. I'm taking it directly from the newspaper. I'm taking it from the Saturday Times of May the 1st, May Day. There's that lovely section in it called, or something like body and soul. Isn't it interesting that color supplement style stuff should have a body and soul section. That's a good, a, a mini mirror on the culture in which we live. In the body and soul one for May Day was an account of Sir, an interview with Sir Roy Strong. Some of you will know this guy. Many of you might not know this guy. Roy Strong was director of the Victoria and Albert Museum and of the National Gallery, very much caught up in the artistic, cultural life of Great Britain, friends with, with royal family members, well known in many circles of the kind of um, museum culture world, but a very keen gardener, really into the natural side of life and so on. The columnist, Nick Curtis, who uh, wrote that very interesting article, described him as a diarist, scholar, retired social gadfly, one who is, quote, raving about the guilty pleasures of the pandemic. Now, his wife, Julia Trevelyan Oman, she had died in 2003. They had lived at the Lasket, a, what was it, 24 roomed house in Herefordshire, a country house. Recently, Sir Roy had moved to a small townhouse in Ledbury, another lovely part of the country, which he described as having two good rooms. Well, how interesting to move from a 24-roomed house to a two-roomed house. Perhaps that might link in to our belongings issue. Recently, he had just sold off many of his possessions. They had made £180,000. They in, uh, included a portrait of himself by David Hockney, one of 17 portraits of himself. I hope you're getting an interesting picture of an individual emerging here. An older man whose lifetime of culture and involvement was now, if you like, reducing. Yes, he had des designed gardens for Elton John and the Prince of Wales, and was now interested in developing his new little garden in Ledbury. Very interesting. Quote, if you ask me if I have any regrets about the things I have sold, the answer is no. Hmm. Nick Curtis then adds, and I wait for the word, Get ready for it. Wait for the word. Nick Curtis adds, this is not doorstadning. Doorstadning. The Swedish term for decluttering and anticipating one's death, but rather a shedding of his old skin as Strong embarks on a new phase. We will return to doorstadning, to old skin, and new embarkations as the lecture goes on. But now, my second main point is this. I, my students get bored stiff with this. Uh, well, they're interested really, but they don't always show it. Uh, I call it the Davis formula. Now, the Davis formula is going to repeat a couple of times in this lecture. What is it? It's about words. That word, doorstadning, few of you will know, many of you won't. I'd never heard of it before I heard of it. There we are. Um, words are interesting. The Davis formula runs like this. The world is full of words. Many of them are names for things. Sometimes an emotion or a cluster of emotions gets attached to a word. When that happens, we have a value. 
Values are words plus emotions. That's the start of the Davis formula. Some of those values contribute to our sense of identity. Some of those emotion pervaded words, values, contribute to our sense of identity. I call those beliefs. They could be political, religious, economic, sporting, familial, they could be anything, they are beliefs. And for many people, that's sufficient. But on the history of humanity, it's often not been sufficient. And in many parts of the world today, it remains insufficient. Why? Because there's a final part of the formula. And the final part of the formula is this, that some beliefs contribute to a sense of destiny. Destiny. Now, the word destiny is very unfashionable today. And one of my little tasks in life is to rehabilitate the word destiny to get it thought about more. Because the whole formula, including destiny, helps us understand grief. Grief for most of us when we are little is just a word. But then things happen, emotions occur, and we find emotions attaching to this word. And it now becomes a kind of a value. And some people know this value and other people don't. For some, it's just a word, mainly for young people, just a word. But for some, it's much more than a word. It's a value. There's emotion in it. And for some people, to follow the formula along a little more, it enters into their sense of identity. Who are you? Oh, I lost my partner. I lost my child. I lost my job. I lost my dog. I lost my faith. All sorts of things, as it were, losses affect identity. I know that the word identity is vastly complex. Uh, I wrote a book called Emotion, Identity and Religion, and I'm not sure I was much the wiser when I finished it as when I began it, but I, at least I thought about it quite a bit. So grief now then is one of these words that will en enable certain people to communicate with a degree of understanding, with others, no, not there, but it's significant. Early in life, maybe we approach it second hand we see our parent parents who might have lost their parent and those little mirror neurons of others that are watching others empathizing with others we all sort of pick up a bit of grief i don't want to call it second hand but slight slightly indirectly but when we do lose our own parent our own partner or whoever then if you like it's it's the first hand stuff and then we no grief. Now, in all of this, the concept of knowing as a cognitive element and the, the concept of feeling, the affective element, are bound together. We are feeling, thinking entities. I know you don't need me to tell you that, but I mention it in passing. And I mention it in passing because in thinking about grief, it's worth spending three or four minutes on the things that one usually spends three or four lectures on, namely the way practitioners and theoreticians have gone about classifying grief, thinking about it, ordering it. A whole cluster of theories that are sort of stage theories. This is something that the English middle class has picked up with a vengeance in the 1970s. I don't want to go into that. That's interesting in itself. Stage theories, being able to name phases and so on, gave some people a sense of a handle to deal with this aspect of life. Others didn't look at it quite like that. But what was happening, in, whether stage theory or not stage theories, was an awareness of diversity of emotional mood-based responses. 
the image I like myself is that of a kaleidoscope. I love kaleidoscopes. You know, you look down that little tube and you turn it. And if I was real high tech guy now, I would have allowed you to see into one of my marvelous kaleidoscopes. And all those patterns change all the time and surprise you. And you're back as you're a child again. These beautiful colors, you're a child again when you look down a kaleidoscope. Grief is rather like a kaleidoscope. There are so many bits and pieces of feelings, experiences, sights, visions, touches. So many parts of your life are inside the grief kaleidoscope. And one minute, the picture is like that. And the next minute, the picture is different. The kaleidoscopic nature of the emotions that make up the values of grief and which can contribute to our sense of identity. Now, of course, for some of us, and this might be important for a latter part of the lecture, for some of us, a person who has been tightly bonded to another person, that can be really quite something. For others who are less, more loosely bonded, maybe other things occur. And I'm going to look at that in detail in a minute. But the kaleidoscope is there. Some people will have shared so many bits that to see one configuration is to see their dead partner, to know, to feel their dead partner. For others, not quite like that. Part of the great complexity of all this. Grief then is really taking us into the nature of our identity and maybe to different periods and times in our identity. And I'm sure in your various, in, in parts of your project, you will be so alert and dealing with those issues of grief in childhood, grief in teenage, grief in whenever. And we know how even those labors are not, not often adequate. The utter complexity of it. The shifting, passing, transforming elements of grief. One of them I want to pick up in particular at this point, and it's where we link in, I suppose, to one of the theoretical issues relating to grief and grief studies, and that's to the whole issue of meaning making. Of course, in a sense, the broadest philosophical, um, sociological, anthropological, psychological, the broadest concept in the whole study of humanity, meaning making. We're all meaning making. But what interests me in a sense about grief is meaning breaking and various theoreticians have thought about this as well. That when we are bereaved, when some people are bereaved, but when many people are bereaved, there are those moments, those moments when nothing makes sense or one has a sense of the unreality of what seems real to everybody else in the street, in the room wherever. That issue, that cultural image we have in Britain, of others not understanding what we have experienced. No one can understand, no one can know. That's an interesting cultural statement actually. And it's important for the notion of individualism to which I'll return in a minute. Or the more negative, nothing matters now. What's the point of it all? And many of us will either have experienced these ourselves or will experience these ourselves or certainly have encountered them in those we, we know and love. Reality, unreality, meaning being thwarted. So how might that relate to things and objects, to possessions? Or in these experiences, those flashback moments, those memories that emerge within, press themselves upon us. I uh, recently uh, written a piece which will be published later in the year on dreams and the role of dreams in relation to our dead visiting us. Flashbacks very often to positive tones, occasionally flashbacks to negative ones. These are interesting moments. And then in many people's um, grief timeline, the moment when, oh, they haven't thought about the dead for a day. 
Well, they haven't thought about them for a little while. Oh, and yesterday I laughed again for the first time for a long time. And it's as though meaning making from society is creeping up upon us and reasserting itself after our loss of it. As some of you will know, and if you don't, it will be one of the books I'm going to put on the, on the reading list, as it were. Um, Alan Keller has a new book, which has a lovely title of Visitors at the End of Life. Visitors at the End of Life. And let me read you towards the conclusion. It's a lovely book because it's descriptive and not evaluative, but throws lots of us who are, who are evaluators off our chairs a little bit. Visits from our dead are important. They are not to be classed together with the Ouija board games, horror films, and palm readings. Visits from the dead are widespread and have always been widespread. The cultural scripts from religion and science often fail us here simply because they debate merely the source and not the meaning of those experiences for those who encounter them. The helping professions can be more helpful if they join forces with the social sciences, history, anthropology, folk studies, and sociology. And I love the choice of categories that, that, that Alan puts in there. The helping professions can be more helpful if they join forces with the social sciences, history, anthropology, folk studies, and sociology to forge an understanding of how these experiences change us. Visits from our dead usually mean us well. Their effects are overwhelmingly positive. Those experiences are not pathologies to be treated. They are, I close my quote in a moment, they are extensions of our experiences of love and loss that must be integrated into our personal and social lives. It is up to us to help that integration. Alan's doing something very interesting there because he's challenging many of our cultural understandings of visits from our dead and the fact that many of us don't talk about visits from our dead as we don't talk indeed about many other things. Let me jump from that strong emphasis back a moment to that destiny factor. I said one of my many goals in life is to uh, restore destiny as a topic of conversation to us in Northern and Western Europe. Uh, I've had a good bash at trying to do this in, in the book that some of you will know, More, Moore's Britannica, Lifestyle and Death Style in Britain Today, was the publisher who wanted a Latin title for it, not me, I can assure you. Uh, destiny there, because it is about meaning making. Destiny is a way of talking about ultimacy in meaning making, the transcending of one level of meaning to arrive at another level of meaning. Now, down the history of mankind and in many parts of the world to this day, Western and Northern Europe, slightly different, Muslims apart, more of which in a minute, Those great human cultural traditions have discussed the afterworld, paradise, heaven, hell, shadowy underworlds. The destiny factor has been a major factor in the history of humanity in relation to death. So what happens if as insightful Westerners, we, we leave that to one side? perhaps not a good idea. Now, within the great Christian cultural tradition, destiny has been enormous. It's all about the grand concept of salvation. It's about what used to be called salvation history. It's about, and this is where it begins to get interesting, it be, it's about and begins focused in that strange concept of resurrection in relation to that strange person, Jesus of Nazareth, in that strange experience or experiences which produced the early Christian sect of Judaism 
and now you're dealing with a worldwide movement of multi-millions. But equally, the Islamic world, where destiny is seriously important, very good anthropological studies of this, which is why it's good to die on a Friday, because you can get more people to come from the prayer services to the funeral service. The more prayers that are made for the dead, the better help we can all be to him or her as he or she now moves into the porch of destiny with the angels of death visiting you in your grave, with you getting an intimation of what destiny is meaning for you. So in Britain today, for example, we've got millions of people for whom death, burial, destiny, and prayers as the nature of the relationship between the living and the now passing one, profoundly important. For those of us who might be secular materialists, those kind of conceptual pressures are perhaps difficult to identify with. Or again, in the Indian derived traditions, where the life force, the Atman is passing on, going on its transmigratory pathways, destiny factors. But yes, I mentioned a moment ago, the secular or mixed. These simple labels are often not very useful, really. The, the mixed nature of our thoughts about the meaning of everything. The rise in Britain, for example, since 1994-95 of woodland burials, green burials, has brought the whole issue of destiny back to haunt us, no, to visit us. Because, and here I got to ride my little hobby horse and say, tough luck to the postmodernists who've had a pretty good run for their money, but tough luck, you know, you may not be able to ride that hobby horse quite as strongly for another reason I'll mention in yet another minute or two, but just now, because there is a new grand narrative. There is a grand narrative, not just for Western and Northern Europe, though they are the protagonists of it, but for the whole world. Ecology, environmentalism. In other words, the destiny of the earth. So though destiny had been lost to many with religious demise, it's a rushing back. Centrifugally to the meaning making of the human animal. For others, of course, destiny at the family level means legacy, one's descendants, one's children, and so on. Enormous pictures there, but I've, I've, I've pressed it to highlight the significance of meaning making squared destiny in that sense. And I'll move on to another section of my talk, which is one in which I want to raise what you're all very familiar with, and that's the, the biocultural nature of emotions, the biocultural nature of grief, therefore, and indeed the biocultural nature of possessions. Historians have often talked about the two bodies when they're talking about a monarch or a great social person. Uh, and we could talk about our two bodies or our two skeletons, if you like. Though skeleton is a bit of a weak concept here. What do I mean? I mean this. We've all got uh, endoskeletons with all the organs attached. We've got inside stuff. And all that inside stuff helps make us who we are. Seriously, big time. I won't elaborate upon it. Our bodies, our embodiment is an enormous aspect of our meaning making and our values and our identity. And for those in those traditions I've already mentioned, for their ongoing destiny factor. So we've got that kind of L endoskeleton. But of course, and in a way that ties up with our biological reality. 
with our bio bit. But we've also got a kind of an exoskeleton. The things we surround ourselves with that make our identity what it is. The exoskeleton of relations with others, the exoskeleton of clothes. I should have been rather dramatic and decided not to wear any clothes to give this lecture today. I could have made that point then rather forcefully, but I, I elected it. Uh, I thought it wiser not to. But our clothes, our belongings, our home, our house, getting on the ladder, the exoskeleton, the dom domestic exoskeleton of the 30 year olds just now in Britain. Not to the Germans, because they're happy to rent, but that's, an, that's another story altogether. The exoskeleton, the cultural aspect of our being, the biocultural, the endo, the exoskeletons of our being, which together comprise our sense of identity, but which also, of course, are very significant when it comes to grief. The grief that is the endo grief, the bio grief, the shock to the systems. And the exo grief, when others say they're sorry, express their sympathies, or in the British, dare I use the word folk myth, cross the street to walk down the other pavement. An idiom well worth analysis in, its, in itself. The skeletons meet, our two bodies, the biocultural nature of our being uh, come together. Social class is really important in all of this. And I could have devoted a half lecture today to social class and grief. I haven't, but it's not because it's not important, because it is really important. And I can move into it as I move from that biocultural aspect of grief to this major concept I want to look at today, which is the difference between the individual and individualism in relation to grief and possessions in relation to the concept of individual, individuality, which we are not so familiar with in our social discussion here. We're all familiar with individuals, individual identity, individualism, the postmodern self, the insular, entity that I am. There are volumes on this. Yes, of course, you could trace it back to Descartes, and I think, therefore, I am. You could trace it through the Enlightenment. You can trace it in many ways. And most of us buy into it. it because it's part of a middle class, certain middle class values. You are, you should be a little individual of your own, you're a little person with your own values, uh, beliefs, you should have, you should have opinions. There's been, there was quite a lot of work on this in educational theory decades ago. But to be a nice little middle-class boy and girl, you need that sort of individualism. And you can let it shine in your CV, you can let it shine in your application to university, and you can let it shine in your job applications as well. But all good ideas have their day. And maybe, as the old song says, it ain't necessarily so. And I want to argue that whilst there is, of course, a great deal of truth in concepts of the individual, the self, selfhood, identity, all that stuff, let's complement it with another perspective. It, 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 it dawned on me rather slowly in a way, and I've written it up in you know, several of my more recent books, really. And, from Indian anthropology, or from anthropology in India, looking at personhood as a complex self. Now, maybe in the West, if we think of complex selves, we think of multiple personalities and we're talking pathology. I'm not talking pathology here. I'm talking normality. The normal compound self, the normal individuality of you and of me. Essentially, this is simply to talk about socialization, of how your mother, your father, your parents, your siblings, your friends are all built into you. You are, I am a jigsaw, 
of bits of all those selves. They are there, they are in me. Recognizing one is a member of a group and acknowledging it, not wanting to stand out from it, has been part of some working class British cultural group understandings. And if you're solidly middle class with a certain type, you don't get it that. Why don't they get on their bike and improve their lives there? The complexity of the human self. I'm minded of, there was a lovely paper, oh, 2000 or so, by Catherine Young. It was a lovely paper. Um, it was called The Memory of the Flesh. The Memory of the Flesh. And what it's about is that experience, some of you look a bit too young to have had this experience yet, but you never know, you, you never know. Uh, I'm now old enough to have it all the time, much of the time. The memory of the flesh, when you come to an age at which you remember your parents, you start doing things, saying things, seeing aspects of yourself, and when you do, you see them. The memory of the flesh, your acknowledgement in your flesh of their flesh, if you like. That's just one prism, the one lens, perhaps a better word, um, in which one knows that others are built into us very, very deeply. It's one reason why I really disbelieve in sociologists who talk about generations X, Y, and Z and stuff. Because some research seems to show that youngsters draw a tremendous amount of influence from their parents. So that, that part of their individual complex out has come from a generation way back down the line, according to the sociological laboring but they're in there firing still, part of the complexity of things. This issue of, of individuality. Now, this pans out in many ways. One of the ways in which it pans out is in relation to things. Because our exoskeleton, those things outside of us, around us, that help make us who we are as a complex entity, carry those other people, mediate those other people, bring those other people to us. The theoretical book that I absolutely love in connection with this is the anthropologist Daniel Miller. He's written a lot. Dan Miller's book on the comfort of things. Miller's The Comfort of Things is a lovely book. He got his students to study one street in London, um, sort of studying the sitting rooms of a street in London. What are the things in your sitting room? What's there? Why are they there? What are the resonances of their being there? What do they mean to you? How do they affect your identity? Do they affect your destiny? What about that cross on the wall? All sorts of issues that are using, if you like, the environment around us to, to feed in. Things are us. I think I'll set up a second hand shop called Things Are Us. And uh, they are. My individuality is made up partly of the things in which I live and move and have my being. Things very interesting. I remember the first time I went to Freud's house in London, which was reproducing his Viennese thing. And um, his desk is absolutely full of little figurines of Greek and Roman and Egyptian gods and goddesses. For the ultimate secularist, I was amazed at the, the spatial symbolic nature of his perception. Important. Some of these objects that make us who we are, we speak of as having sentimental value. Things that we receive. We inherit. I've got stuff in the house I really wish I could get rid of, but I can't because I've sort of inherited them. You curate them for the next generation or something. There's a whole body of theory in anthropology that many of you are familiar with in gift theory, reciprocity theory. And one of the books that 
develops that is a lovely book by Maurice Godelier, uh, The Enigma of the Gift. And in The Enigma of the Gift, he develops this issue of how certain objects link us to the sources of our self. They can be, it can be to the gods, it can be to your ancestors. The things that you have, that you have received, they're not like birthday presents and things like that, no. These are the gifts of sentimental value which root us in the past and roots the past in us, which help make me a individual entity. And these are fascinating things. I went earlier on to get one visual aid that I have for my lecture today. My one visual aid for the lecture today, so you can all wake up now, anybody who's asleep. My one visual aid is this. Do you see him? It's probably the cheapest object in my house. It's made up of sort of chalk or something like that. It's not very beautiful. But of sentimental value? Yes. Why? Because when my parents, who, as they would have said in those days, were courting from the time they were very young, really, went to the fair. And my dad knocked a coconut off a shy and won his little horse, which was his first present to his girlfriend. Now you can imagine, they would never talk about it like this. They would be deeply, they're dead now, fortunately. They'd be very embarrassed to hear me talking about this like this. But you can imagine how they both felt about that and why they kept it for 60 years. The enigma of the gift lodged as it were within us. Now this brings me, and I must press on now rather rapidly, this brings me to this whole issue of death cleaning and life clearing. And it brings us to this lovely little book by Margareta Magnusson, The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning. 94 year, 90 odd year old lady, it's a lovely little book, very simple. How to sort your stuff out while you're still alive before you die so that your adult daughters don't have to do it themselves. She'd had to clear out after her husband and somebody else twice so she thought now that she was ancient, she'd sort her stuff out. And she gives you lovely advice on how to do it. It's a lovely little book with artistic representation because she's an artist as well. Door standing, death cleaning. When I, I've done a lot of work in Sweden. And when I went back to some of my Swedish colleagues and said, hey, what about this concept of door standing then? They said, well, it's not a very common Swedish word. You don't use it in everyday life. It's... We know what it means, but you just don't use it really. So I thought to myself, oh, I wonder if it's um, a publisher's ploy to put one of those magic Swedish words up to enthrall you and, and you know, wheel you in. Well, whatever is the case, it is interesting, partly because it's the tip of that iceberg of minimalism. Marie Kondo, there's a whole host of them. James Wallman's lovely little book, Staffocation. If you don't know Staffocation, it's well worth a read. All these volumes that are talking to us about the exoskeleton of our complex identity, what you can lose, what you can give, what you should get away from yourself as you prepare for your own final identity or destiny. Fascinating. How does that link with basic theories of grief? I'm speeding up just now. Grief theory is complicated. You know as much about it as I do. Part of your project, it's enormous field in itself. Here I'm just looking at two of the, the pinnacles of grief theory, attachment and loss theory and continuing bonds theory. For much of the 19th, for much of the 20th century, attachment and loss won the day. Freud, Bowlby, others, many others, our attachments to others and our attachments to things. That when we lose them, we 
engage in that grief work in all sorts of activities to, as it were, free ourselves and become into the future what we need to be. Attachment and loss. It's one of those things you either deal with in three minutes, as I just have, or in, you know, 30 hours, which I'm not. Um, attachment and loss. But then, hey-ho, we get to the end of the 20th century, and all of a sudden, there's a new kid on the block. Continuing bonds now comes to be the Vogue theory. This is interesting. We retain our bonds with the dead. Yes, we can dream about them. We can go to the cemetery. We, all sorts of ways. We continue our bonds with the dead. And now it's not a bad thing. Now it's a healthy and good thing to do. Continuing bonds, increasing volumes coming out on this. My question to you in this lecture is this. Take those two theories. I know there are others. Take those two theories. Attachment and loss, continuing bonds. And ask yourself this question. Are they grounded in a theory of the individual? And my answer to that by and large is yes, they are, because that was the culture of fashion. Or can they be, should they be better grounded in a theory of individual complex personality, identity, rather? That's my question. And I think, because I think there's a great deal of truth in attachment and loss stuff, I think there's a great deal of truth in continuing bonds as well, and I don't think it's an either or. But what I do think is interesting is what happens when we approach them, these theories, with from the standpoint of the individual or from the individual complex personality. It's a very slight theoretical adjustment of the lens, if you like, but the pictures that emerge can be significantly different. So what do dreams now mean? If you start from the individual standpoint, what do those experiences of the dead coming to you mean? How do you understand those? How similar are they or are they not to our relationships with those we love and our friends and so on and so forth? There is an issue here then with spin-offs for possessions. What can I and can I not get rid of? I cannot get rid of those things, you might say, that make up my individual complex identity. I can get rid of things that don't quite do that, achieve that. And that almost takes us back to the beginning of this lecture, to those ideas of what emotions are attached to what words or to what things and how those things are or are not our exoskeleton within our, within our total sense of identity. As we then, I'm concluding now, as we face the fact of our death and our mortality, and this is uh, something much easier said than done, and seems to me to be, in my life experience at least, seems to be part of one's lifeline, that when you're young, a single individual, a, a person, when that person is young, early middle age, middle age, later middle age, older, things change, perceptions change profoundly. Yes, in relation to objects, but might it not be folly to minimalize one's latter years in terms of possessions? I'm going to be an advocate for a minute, arguing against the local charity shop and junk shop. I'm going to say, no, keep them all. And I say, why did you want to get rid of stuff? Ah, 
Is that itself a ritual symbolic activity of anxiety? Because thoughts of death and of dying attract all sorts of emotions, including anxiety, fear, as well as maybe anticipation and pleasure, but they're all there. And how we behave, our activities, express those directions of emotional flow. So maybe you want to spring clean your life because you're terrified of dying. You cover it up by saying, oh, it'll be easier for my relatives. Or not. It might be genuinely that by divesting oneself of stuff, one is investing oneself with a destiny pathway. Certainly, the great stream, great streams within Buddhism would teach us not to grasp, possess, desire, and hold. A main traditional stream in Hinduism would have us move back from social life, even for those very few who might do it traditionally, perform our own funeral ceremony when we move into isolation before we die. There are traditions, if you like, which see minimalism as a way of detaching from the world. But how many of us, and this is now where these kind of issues become existential philosophical uh, quandaries, how many of us have the strength, let alone the desire, to prepare to die? We know that in Britain, many people won't, don't want to write their wills because the last will and testament is in its own way a symbolic expression of death clearing, life cleaning. And I wanted to introduce this phrase, life cleaning, to add on, if you like, to Margareta Magnusson's a death cleaning. Because I'm wondering, and I'm still thinking about this, how clearing is different from cleaning. And here I could go into all sorts of anthropological things about purity, and I'm not going there. But there are here there are issues to think about. We are right back at the beginning of words just being words in the Davis formula and what emotions are being attached to words. So when I raise the issue, that phrase death cleaning, what values, what, what emotions come to that word for you to generate what kind of value? It's worth, as it were, thinking, thinking it out. Because in one odd sense, these issues are part of that great, I suppose one of the great theoretical turns of the last 25, 30 years of reflexivity. Everything is reflexive. Who am I, where am I coming from? How do I think about things? So when we are thinking then about grief, possessions, personhood, the reflexivity for those of us who are academics and who are used to playing with ideas, but often in our playing with ideas, we are really also organizing our own existential jigsaw. I can't answer that, of course. That is something which, uh, which you alone can answer. Well, we started with Sir Roy, we end with Sir Roy. How interesting it was. Decluttering for embarkation. But he wasn't talking about decluttering for embarkation to his eternal destiny. I don't think he was rather into that. But to what forever phase of life remained to him with his new garden, with his house in Ledbury with two good rooms, all very interesting. And I'm going to put the coal on there and, and end with it by, of course, saying, just think how we could have developed these notions into care home sociology, 
care home dynamics, care home personhood. And that's where I'll stop. We can have a look at that. We can share that page before we then go anywhere else. Thanks. Thank you very much, Douglas. That was really, really interesting. So I'm just going to share your uh, reference page now and we'll give people a couple of minutes just to have a think about some questions. Okay, just a 